As part of an ongoing conversation about education, the role it plays in our lives and the role it will play in our future, I'm honored to speak with a living legend, Dr. Farooq Elbaz. What role do you think education plays in all of this? The whole thing was driven by education. The whole thing was driven by people looking at books. For instance, the book of Jules Verne, From the Earth to the Moon, was illustrated at the time when they did. And the illustrations showed that there were three men that went into a spacecraft that had a shape which very much like the Apollo mission. It went to the moon and so found a lot of rocks. And the three people that went to the moon, according to Jules Verne, kind of became dizzy because of the difference in gravity between the Earth and the moon. And all of these things kind of were, became reality. So he wrote this 200 years ago, and but he, the, the ideas that he proposed became a reality. So meaning that the human mind can initiate all kinds of thought. And I took these pictures to the Apollo program directors to show that there was somebody that drew a, the, the spacecraft that went to the moon in that shape, which is the shape on here. And then there were rocks and so on. And the Apollo program director said, my God, we all read these books. They must have affected us, affected even the designs subconsciously, meaning just reading that book may have affected the shape of the mission to the book. Who inspired you or who was, you know, motivation to, you know, get an explanation for everything that exists? Maybe really my father because of his uh, reading. My father was a teacher of Islam in the Azhar University, the oldest university in the world, kind of, because it was n n the year uh, 969, established nine, with, the, with the initiation of Cairo as a city. And uh, he became a leading member of that place. And he used to have a bookshelf covered with glass in our, his tiny bedroom. And he would go to this library every night and bring in a book and very carefully and very gently open the glass door and bring it in. And we were all young kids, like four of us, would sit around him. And he would sit down, put the book on his that and then first rub it outside so they make sure there is not a speck of dust on it and then he would j open it very gently and begin to read to us and then tell us what it means. Then as I went to school and so on I saw him uh, begin to teach my mother how to read and write because my mother was not able to go to school from the village and so and he they got busy with life until he got his education, until he gets married and all that, and then he, after he became a big man in his field, he began to teach her how to read and write. And that affected me a lot, to see him teaching her how to read and write, meaning that reading and writing is a very important thing to, for, for my father to teach my mother this way. And then I became attached to the book. And, and that went on. Um, once the Apollo mission happened, you brought your mother here to show her this is how, where the magic happens. And she just asked you a simple question as to when the ra rocket does take off, there's so much fire that comes out. How does nothing melt? That's right. And so that question blew your mind yeah. away. Do you want to talk to me about that she experience? She wasn't asking me, actually, because before I went to Cape Canaveral, I called the director who was part of the Apollo program, a friend of mine. And so I told him that my mother is here. He said, my mother? I'm from Egypt. I said, yes. I said, God damn. He said, tell me when you're coming. And I would send the car to pick you up and so on. And in the old days, we used to have to be able to go and drive a car right to the airplane, picked us up, and went to his office. He said, come to have a coffee with me at 9 o'clock. And then you can show your mother what you want to show. And then so we sat in his office, and we started drinking coffee. And then she started asking him a very simple question, because this was a, a woman that had never been to school. And her questions were very simple. And she would start with saying, you say that there is no gravity around the Earth. There is gravity around the Earth, and that's why the spacecraft goes around it. And there is gravity around the moon, and that's why the spacecraft would retreat around it. But on its way between the Earth and the moon, say there is no gravity in between. He says, yes. He said, why would the spacecraft continue to move in that direction? <laughs> Simple said, but powerful. Hey, Far Farouk, you got to help me here. <laughs> and then she started asking questions like that one by one. So he would not be able to answer. He would call someone from the orbital mechanics. And then he calls the guy from the physics. He again calls, uh, there were six people. And then came the last question of, uh, 
because he took her to the model of the rocket that goes up and started telling her exactly because she said, you say that the rocket's standing this way because it is locked up to a st the stand. I said, yes. He said, but when you release it from the stand, why doesn't the rocket fall? <laughs> <laughs> simple question. <laughs> so, simple que so I had to show her the model and what the, the, how, how the release is made and steps. And then she said, and then the fire. Why, do, why, don't the, why doesn't f fire up and burn all kinds of things? He said, we've got to show her the, 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 uh, the, the, the releasing, uh, the release hole. So right, right under the rocket. So let's go. And he got the car and went down to under the rocket to show her where the, the light, the, the fire would go and release this way. And that's why there is a huge kind of smoke coming out of that. And so anyway, it was, we had lunch in the meantime. So it was between 9 and 5 p.m. <laughs> all of these questions and he was he was fascinated by the simple questions that he never thought of and the people around him also were fascinated by questions that they never even even said so that they may be possible somebody to ask these questions and they would uh, just look at each other and laugh when they don't know the Im immediate answer and after she said so, so so all of this she said my son god was saving me for this day for this day I said, what do you mean? He said, all of your aunts and relatives and this and that would go to Paris and London and tell me we did this and we bought that and so on. And I'm just sitting in the house doing nothing and just caring of you guys. But God was saving me this to this day because none of these people could ever see what I saw today. Because today I have seen the guts of Apollo. <laughs> you have lived in America for uh, many years now, but what is the... Egyptian in you taught you about life? A lot of things, because you cannot really take the Egypt out of me. So in, in many ways, the, when I think about something, even scientifically, or something that relates to the position of Egypt in the world, whatever, it is, I start first with the perception of an Egyptian. And then I go on with the, with the rest of it, with the perception of a Westerner. So it is uh, certainly be because of my feeling that I'm still connected to Egypt. I didn't feel separated from it. I still feel connected in many ways, even though my full work is, has been in the U.S. for decades, not years. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the, still, the, uh, the, the connection is still mental, emotional, and otherwise. Now that you've lived here for decades, like you were mentioning, what has the American life taught you? Simplicity and being just like any other, uh, all people are equal, nothing special. The fact that you have a degree that's for yourself, for the PhD, well, that's for yourself, not for us. I mean, so I'm, we're, uh, I'm a, a cleaning man, but I'm just as good as you are. And, uh, and you, you and I are equal in every way. The fact that you have a PhD is, is for you, not for me. So that's something very American. And the ability to make sure that you can you can say anything that you feel without disturbing or making the other one feel better feel bad so it's the, the ability to be to be open and open minded and open tongue and you say what you feel and what you believe very simply without being without an attack on anyone or any either idea are there any lessons that you have learned uh, being a geologist in Egypt and now in America and that learning being used in the concept of people going to Mars? A huge amount, vast amounts. Because when I started looking at the desert in Egypt, we're looking at arid landforms, the desert and wind and sand and sand dunes and all of that and plateaus that are cut by all kinds of things. And then we began to look and see evidence of former rivers and streams coming out from these plateaus coming down and then completely submerged in the open desert. And all you see is really just reddish colored sand and the, at the, at the abutting all of these landforms. With the very first pictures of Mars, we saw exactly the same thing. And in real life we had, there is a NASA book that is <laughs> Desert Landform Southwest Egypt. Analogs to planet Mars. <laughs> this <laughs> is the title. Right. So yeah, because of the similarity of, of, of these things, meaning that the deserts of the Earth have actually taught us about the geologic history of Mars. 
there's condition of the past where very wet conditions it used to rain a great deal and all kinds of water and 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 Mars had a just like the Egypt had an ocean and many lakes and so on and then the weather conditions changed drastically and the water disappeared on Mars as ice and on Earth as groundwater and only now the wind takes over so everything that you see today is the, in the a result of the wind action erosion and deposition all by wind and this is exactly what's happening on Mars so that we have we, what we described in the desert landforms in Egypt definitely there is a, a, a identical things all all through the whole desert and on Mars wow. Great and whatever and whatever whatever we learn from Mars can also have help us understand a little more about the desert so no question about it. but we started with that first the, the landforms in Egypt and when we saw similar things on Mars we've actually began to compare them and figured out that they formed in exactly the same processes. So in a way, and it's like parallel learning, trying parallel to see learning. what's happening here and there. Yep, that's why I, I pushed the, my fellow colleagues from the International Astronomical Union to place the name of Cairo on Mars. From the pyramids of Egypt to the moon and to Mars, Dr. Farouk took us on a trip through history, through his journey, and gave us a glimpse of the future. On behalf of Dr. Farooq and Michael Armanius, for Arlington Public News, I'm Akriti Jagmohan.